He used to enter alone in the temple and be found kneeling and praying for the forgiveness of the people so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God. And this pastor that Eusebius wrote about has been nicknamed over the years Old Camel Knees. Do you know what pastor he wrote about? It's James. It's Pastor James. It's James that wrote the letter that we are studying. It's James who was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem in the book of Acts. You know, some people can be identified by their hands. You know, it's kind of difficult for a mechanic to get every trace of grease out from underneath his fingernails. In fact, I was a mechanic when Laura and I got married, and our wedding pictures are still an embarrassment. My fingernails are black. If you're a painter, it can be nearly impossible to remove every speck of paint from your hands. A construction worker, a laborer, his hands are hard and callous. But James, he's not identified by his hands, but what's he identified by? His knees. You ever seen camel's knees? I've never seen any up close and personal, but I've seen pictures. You've probably all seen the pictures of a camel kneeling down on the front legs to let his rider off. Well, he's not really doing that. Camels lay down to rest. I suppose they train them to do that. But they, they go down, I'm sorry, on their knees to rest. And their knees look like, well, they look like the soles of hiker boots. I mean, they're rough and they're coarse. And James had been given that nickname because he apparently spent a lot of time praying, a lot of time on his knees. Now, should we kneel to pray? Is that a biblical mandate to kneel? No, it's not. There's no biblical command, no biblical injunction to kneel. There are lots of pictures of prayer on our knees. Maybe it's something that we should practice more because it is a picture of humility when a person is on their knees or even prostrate on their face before God. There's a place for that. I remember hearing years ago about the well-known Baptist pastor W.A. Criswell, who pastored First Baptist Church of Dallas for 50 years or more. He installed, I believe in the 70s it was, he installed some prayer railings or kneeling benches that came out somehow from underneath the pew in front of the congregants. And at best of my memory, he did that during a, a tumultuous time of the life of the church. There was, I believe, the potential for a church split, and so he had those kneeling rails installed. Anything that helps encourage a Christian to pray is a good thing. And James is going to do more than encourage us to pray. He's going to command us to pray. He's going to tell us we need to pray. We have to pray. In fact, Pick it up with me in verse 13. We'll read verse 13 through 18 of James 5. He says, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, we just sort of touched on this passage last week. We just sort of used it as a launching pad, as a springboard. And we came across some difficult phrases, some things that caused some legitimate questions in our mind. What's this anointing with oil? What does sickness have to do with sin? Why are the elders called in to pray for these people? There are some legitimate questions that we need to try to get some answers for when we read this passage, but there's one message that is crystal clear, and that message is pray. Six of six verses 
mention prayer. So if what Eusebius wrote about James is true, that he had camel knees, that he was a man known for his prayer, then we need to listen to him. He is a man who walked the talk. We need to listen because this is Scripture, but we need to listen from a man who gave a legitimate example of prayer. Now, although the message of prayer is easy enough to see here, again, some of the things that surround the prayer have caused much, much difficulty for years. Lots and lots of interpretations have come from these six verses. In fact, in all my reading, studying, and listening to various resources on this passage, I came up with nine different nine different interpretations of this passage. Two of the nine are really easy to do away with really quickly. Faith healers like Benny Hinn and others love verse 15. Again, 15, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. They love to quote that verse. But there's one important fact about this passage and about that verse that the faith healers never mention. Who is the one doing the praying in this verse? Is it the sick person? No, it's the elders. It's the elders praying for the sick person. It's the elders who are to have the faith. But what does the faith healer tell the person who doesn't get the promised healing? You don't have enough faith. They should turn it back on themselves. I didn't have enough faith. That's not what they do. That's easy to discount. That false understanding, that false interpretation. Aside from the fact that they don't take that into account, everybody dies. No one is healed completely until eternity. Everybody dies. No one is promised perfect health in this life. That promise doesn't exist in Scripture. Another teaching that's fairly easy to disprove from this passage is that from the Roman Catholic Church, that of extreme unction or last rites, as it's sometimes called. If you have a Roman Catholic background or you know anything about Catholicism, you know what that is. This is the when a priest comes in, there's typically a serious illness. A person is on their deathbed, although I do understand that there is another point in time when the priest will come in and do the same thing. But but initially in the 8th century, I believe, is when this started. The priest would come in. A person's on their deathbed with some kind of extreme illness. They come in with some type of special oil. They anoint the body, and then they pray. And this is in preparation for eternity. This is an assistance to salvation. At the very least, this would get them into purgatory. This would take care of sins and get them into purgatory where they can be prayed into eternity. Well, there's lots of problems with that understanding, and some of them just at face value are, are, are easy to discount. Who is it that's called to do the praying in the passage? The sick person is to call for who? The elders of the church. There are no priests mentioned here. Elder is the word pre presbyteros, is the Greek word presbyteros. It literally refers to an old man. I am fast becoming characteristic of that requirement for an elder. Fast becoming an old man. New Testament elder, pastor, same thing. Not a priest. There is no priest in this passage. Another obvious problem with this is that extreme unction, or last rites, is focusing on death. James is focusing on what? Life. Restoration. In verse 15. Well, that's just two of the nine. I won't, I won't go through the nine views that I discovered. But again, there are some questions that we have to answer to understand this passage. But I think understanding these six verses, for me anyway, comes down to one question. Who is this person that is being prayed for in verse 14? Who is this sick person? Is anyone 
among you suffering, verse 14, I'm sorry, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He has to sing praises. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Who is this person? Well, what I want to do this morning is answer that question and then give you some application in what I'll call a weekly prayer guide, and that's W-E-A-K-L-Y, weekly prayer guide. Who is this being prayed for? Well, James gives us some clues. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Anyone among you? So this is a known group of people. This is a community of people. And when this group of people need prayer, they're told to do two things. Call for the elders, verse 14. Verse 16, go to one another. Pray for one another. Verse 14, call for the elders of the church. Verse 16, pray for one another. So where are you going to find elders? If you need to be prayed for, if you need someone to pray for you, you need an elder, you need another Christian to pray for you, where are you most likely to find them? In a church. So this is a church environment. This is a Christian. This sick person is a Christian. This is a sick Christian. The people know each other. They know the elders. But what is this sickness? This Christian is sick with what? Does he have a cold? Does he have cancer? Does he have the flu? Diabetes, coronavirus, heart problems, an ingrown toenail. What sickness? Is it mild? Is it serious? What is it? That's important to understand James' thinking here. The word sick in verse 14 simply means to be without strength, to be weak, to be feeble. The Greek word is astheneo. The word is used all over the Gospels for those with some kind of illness. We know that much of Jesus' ministry was spent healing the sick. You see this word often connected with Christ and His healing ministry. This word, in its verb form, astheneo, is used 36 times in the New Testament. It's a popular word. Let me give you a few examples. Luke 4, verse 40. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, that's Jesus, and laying his hands on each of them, he was healing them. So these sick people were brought to Christ, we know that picture, and he healed them. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is seen healing people with physical illnesses, and very often it is the word James uses in 5.14. Another example, John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, there's our word, Lazarus of Bethany. You remember what happened to Lazarus in John 11? He died. So we could assume this was a, in fact we can know this was a serious sickness. The word is used in all four Gospels describing sickness from some kind of deadly disease to someone who is paralyzed. Seventeen times in the Gospels it's used this way. But when we get to the epistles, we see the word used in another way. We see the word showing up describing spiritual weakness or moral weakness. I don't want you to get bored with all the usages of the word, but it's very important that you understand this particular word. In some ways, the whole passage hinges on this one word. Let me give you a few more examples. Romans 4.19, Paul describes Abraham not becoming weak in faith. That's our word, astenaos. Romans 14, Paul speaks of the person with a weak faith. Verse 1, he says, except the one weak in faith. Verse 2, he says, one person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who eats vegetables only. 
It's the person who can't eat certain foods, who thinks it's a sin, it's taboo. It'll somehow affect his relationship with God who has the weak conscience. Romans 14, as you probably know, is instructions on how to deal with the, the questionable areas of life, the gray areas of life. Speaking of the same theme, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 12, Paul says, By sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. I'm just giving you some pictures of the word used in, in different contexts. In the Gospels, it's physical sickness. Very often in the epistles, it's a weak conscience. It's weak faith. It's weak morality. To these same Corinthians, Paul expresses his concern for their spiritual weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 29. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? Just a few verses before this, he speaks to them about the scenario he had in which he asked God three times to remove the thorn in the flesh. We talked about that just a few weeks ago, I believe. We don't know what that was. There have been lots of things suggested. Malaria, eye trouble, stomach trouble. Whatever it was, the answer was clear from God. My grace is sufficient for power is perfected in weakness. Well, although there's been many things suggested as to what this thorn in the flesh was, Paul tells us what it was. He calls it a messenger of Satan. I think it's reasonable enough to conclude that it was either a demon or a demon-possessed person in the church at Corinth trying to blow up Paul's ministry. And he dogged his tracks, or the demon dogged his tracks. God asked him and asked him and asked him to remove it. And he said, no, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Now, listen to Paul's answer, his response to God's answer in the same passage, verses 9 and 10. After God told him, my grace is sufficient, power is perfected in weakness, Paul says, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. So this weakness that Paul talks about here is connected to the sufferings that he asked God to help him with. And surely those sufferings, some of them at least, would have been spiritual sufferings. I think all of us can identify with Jesus' words to his sleepy disciples in Matthew 26, 41. Jesus is about to face the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. He's, asked his, he's gone into the garden. He's asked his disciples to sit a little ways outside and to pray while he's praying. Well, they can't stay awake. They're, they nod off, they nod off, they nod off. Jesus knows the struggle. And he knows what the root problem is, and he says to them, Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The Spirit is willing, their Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Their Spirit is willing. Do you remember what he said? But the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Here's what I'm trying to tell you in all these verse examples. The word weak does not have to be translated sick as it is in James 5, 14. Again, the word literally means weak, without strength, feeble. Many times the word is used of someone physically ill, but as you saw, many times it is also used of someone who is morally, spiritually sick or weak. Paul uses the adjective form of the word, telling us what to do with weak people. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, help the weak. What does a weak person need? They need strength. They need help. They may lack assurance of salvation. They may struggle with unbiblical guilt. They may fall into the same old sin patterns again and again and again. They may be discouraged. They may be depressed. They may be like the person who said, 
I've been having some issues with doubt. It's not that I doubt God's word. I doubt that I believe it. Maybe that's the person who is weak. Either way, they need help. So if we take the uses of the word, it's been used this many times to refer to sick people. It's been used this many times to refer to spiritually sick people. And whichever one way outweighs the other one, is that the interpretation? Should we just count the uses of the word? No, that's dangerous. It's helpful. It's needful to do word studies. It's enlightening to do word studies, but you don't just come to the Bible or come to a, a Greek lexicon or to Strong's Concordance and just start looking at definitions and count how many times it's defined this way and say, aha, it means that here. What do you have to do anytime you're interpreting Scripture? Context is king. Context, context, context. You have to look at the context, put the pieces of the puzzle together. I'll show you this more and more as we go through the passage. It's going to take this week and next week at least. But I don't think James has physical illness in mind here. I don't think he's thinking about someone being healed from whatever physical issue someone might have had. I think James has spiritual sickness on his mind. I think he's thinking about people who are down, who are discouraged, who are depressed who are struggling, they're going through persecution, they've gone through great loss, they feel like they're taking one step forward and two steps backwards. Some of them apparently have even got to the place where they can't even find a motivation to pray. Let me give you another reason why I'm convinced. I'm convinced because of the, the word usage that I mentioned to you of astaneo, translated sick here, but I'm also convinced from verse 15, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. That's not the same word sick that he uses in verse 14. This is another word, six. And it's only used one other time in Scripture. It's used in Hebrews 12, 3, which says, Consider him, and that's Christ, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Our word for sick there is weary or grow weary. The Greek word literally means to weary from work. And in Hebrews 12, the weariness comes from verse 14. The writer says, You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And basically, you're striving against sin... You're getting weary. Don't grow weary because you haven't worked as hard as Christ did in dealing with sin. You haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. So that's the word that James uses in 5.15. So it's safe to look at verse 14 and read it. Is anyone among you weak? And it's safe to read verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is weary. Weak and weary. Well, again, we have to look at the context, though, most importantly. What's the context of James' thinking? What's the context of the passage? What's the context of the book? Look at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Does that sound familiar? It should. James has been talking about suffering. Just glance back to verse 10. He points out the prophets. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets. This, this suffering that James refers to in verse 10 and verse 13 it's not the suffering of a physical illness. That's not what he's talking about with the prophets. It's the suffering like Jeremiah went through when he was the prophet Jeremiah was thrown into a pit, to an abandoned well, and left to die. It's the suffering that Daniel went through when he was snatched from his home as a teenager. It's the suffering that Daniel went through when he was thrown to the lions. You remember for what? For praying. It's the 
suffering of Moses in dealing with a rebellious, hard-headed people that he tried to lead. It's the suffering that Paul mentions in 1 Timothy 2.9, 2 Timothy 2.9, I'm sorry. Let me back up to verse 8. Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. The word hardship, I suffer hardship. That's the same idea in James. Also, Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 5, encouraging Timothy, but you... Be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. There's no mention there of any kind of physical illness. They're all related to spiritual matters. All related to serving Christ. Now think about the context of the book. The context of the people that James originally wrote to. Jewish Christians. They were hated by two groups of people. Hated by their fellow Jews because they sold out Judaism and followed what they thought was a false Messiah. Hated by the pagans because they were righteous. Because they were committed to righteous living. Also remember in the immediate context of chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. James gives us a picture of professing Christians, wealthy landowners who were withholding money, keeping back paychecks for day laborers, money that was desperately needed. They were controlling the courts, keeping the, the poor day laborers from being able to do anything about the injustice. So these people that James wrote to knew all about suffering. Their lives were marked by suffering. And I think James had this suffering in his mind when he wrote verses 13 through 18. He definitely had it in mind when he opened the book. We remember that he started off with trials. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. And he knew that these believers would struggle with how to sort through the difficulties of life, looking for answers. And so what did he do? He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him do what? Ask of God. And that wisdom there is wisdom in dealing with the trials, dealing with the difficulties, the tribulations, the sufferings of life. Many Christians, and you you can see this in, in new believers, in young believers, many Christians think, You trust Christ, you become a Christian, and life is all sunshine and lollipops. That is not true. In fact, becoming a Christian makes life harder. Much, much harder. It brings responsibilities. It brings stresses and strains. Remember, Jesus said it's the narrow road, not the wide road that leads to life. The road that everybody is on is the easy road. The road to Christ, the road to eternity, the road to salvation is a difficult road. I'm not implying you do anything to earn salvation. It's just not easy to be a Christian. Difficulties are par for the course. The believers in Acts 14.22 needed to be reminded of this. Paul and Barnabas, it says, strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and listen to this, and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas encouraged these believers, don't give up. Life is hard. Tribulations are real. But you have to go through them. They're part of God's plan. So what's our greatest resource And going through suffering. Prayer. It's prayer. James again already told them this in chapter 1. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He acknowledges the reality of those trials. The book of James is bookended by two things. 
Trials in prayer, suffering in prayer. He opens the same, he closes the same. So in my mind, for him to change direction here, oh, you're suffering. Oh, if any of you are sick, by the way, there's healing available. It doesn't make sense to me to make the theme healing, physical healing all of a sudden. It seems out of place to me. Well, I told you I'd give you two more reasons why I believe James is not talking about physical sickness. I gave you two already. I want to give you one more. Think about the New Testament and the prayers recorded in the New Testament. How many prayers can you think of where someone is praying for someone's physical illness? Can you think of any? Can you think of a time when Paul was praying for this person's sickness or this person's healing or this person's health? You probably can't. It's okay to pray for health. Believe me, when I'm sick, when my chest is ripped open, I want you praying for me. Thank you. And you should pray for yourself and you can pray for your physical health. It's biblical to do so because we can pray about what? Anything and everything. We are grateful for Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And then what happens? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, of course, we can pray about our health. Of course, we can pray about our brothers and sisters in Christ and their health. Most Christians don't have any problem doing that. In fact, that is the majority of the things that we pray for. The last time someone asked you, how can I pray for you? You probably said something like, uh, you can pray for this illness. You named it. Yeah, you had a relational issue or you needed a job or you needed a car or you're having financial troubles. That's all fine and good. We can do that. But most of the prayers in the New Testament are not directed toward those kinds of things. They're directed toward spiritual issues. Let me give you some examples from Jesus, who would be our ultimate example in prayer. Luke twenty two thirty two. 32, this is a prayer for Peter. Jesus says, I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. Isn't that a good prayer to pray for another brother or sister in Christ? I'm praying for you that you not give up. I'm praying for you that your faith not fail while you struggle with cancer or whatever. That's a biblical prayer. A few verses later, same chapter, verse 40. Again, the scene is the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus told his disciples he's going to pray. He told them how to pray. Pray that you not enter into temptation that's a prayer every believer needs prayed for them are you tempted to sin every day of your life the greatest prayer in the bible greatest prayer of jesus definitely is in john 17 verse 11 jesus prays for the protection and unity of his disciples and by extension all believers Verse 15, he prays for protection from Satan for them. He says, keep them from the evil one. Verse 17, he prays for their sanctification, that is their maturity. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Those are the kinds of things that Jesus prayed for his followers. Paul, he prayed for the lost in Romans 10.1. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. That's a biblical prayer. Paul prayed for the Corinthians who gave him all kinds of difficulty, that they'd live godly lives, 2 Corinthians 13, 7. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong. Paul's typical prayer pattern is actually seen very clearly in Ephesians Ephesians 3, this is a long prayer, but it's a good one, 14 through 21. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in 
heaven and on earth derives its name. That he would grant you, he's praying for believers, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And he closes it out with this two-verse doxology. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Consistently, the Bible focuses on that which is eternal, the health of our souls. And I'm convinced that that is James' focus as well. He's far more concerned with spiritual health than he is physical health. Not that physical health is not unimportant or that God doesn't care. Obviously, he does. Well, here is James' prayer guide, the weekly prayer guide I promised I would give you. that It's in six areas. Number one, pray when you don't feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. Number two, pray when you do feel like it. Number three, ask for help when you can't pray. Number four, pray when you sin. Number five, pray with other believers. And number six, pray thoughtfully. We'll just stick our toes in the water into the first two for this morning. The first one, again, pray when you don't feel like it. This may be when you need to pray the most. As is the case with a lot of things in life, probably the thing that you don't want to do the most is the thing that you need to do the most. Recovering from my heart surgery over the months, you know, I was forced in the hospital by some nurses and forced in my home by a particular nurse, get up and go walk. I don't want to walk. I want to sit here, get up and walk. It's what I needed. Prayer is a lot like that. We know that we need to pray, but there are times that we don't want to pray. It's the last thing that we want to do, but that's when we most need to pray. John Calvin said, there is no time in which God does not invite us to himself. No time. No time in which God does not invite us to himself. Doug read for us earlier from 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul says, Blessed be the God, our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to how he's described. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, in our sufferings, in our trials, in our difficulties. Where else are we going to go for real, lasting comfort? Do you remember the old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? It was playing this morning when you came in. I hope you listened. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Peter reminds us of this same truth. 1 Peter 5, 7, he's quoting Psalm 55, 22, when Peter says, Casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. So we pray when we don't feel like it. The psalmist said in Psalm 43, 5, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God. 
For I shall again praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. The tap to that hope, the way to that hope in God is prayer. Pray when you don't feel like it. Secondly, pray when you do feel like it. James says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Cheerful here is not freedom from trouble. It's a cheerful attitude. It's a happy spirit, happy in spirit and soul, despite what the circumstances might be. What's this person to do? James says, sing praises. Aren't praises a part of prayer? Isn't even singing a part of prayer? I hope Sunday after Sunday you find yourself just through spontaneous prayer through the music. Particularly, how can a Christian not pray as you sing a song like Jesus, Your Mercy this morning? How can you not pray? How can you not praise God with more than your lips? How can you not just burst within yourself with joy and praise and thanksgiving to God? So pray when you do feel like it. Pray when you don't. Pray when you do feel like it. Pray when you're hurt. Pray when you're happy. Most importantly, pray. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, The one urge which a Christian should never ignore is the urge to pray. Never ignore the urge to pray. And never forget this fact. From Hebrews 4, we can only pray because of Christ. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a privilege to be able to go before the God of the universe when we don't feel like it and when we do feel like it and lay our weak, weary soul before Him and say, help. Do you need to do that this morning? Do you need someone else to pray for you? Do you need to look at another believer in the eye and say, I'm weak here, I'm weary here, will you pray for me? I give you, in, in closing the, the service, or at least the sermon, I give you five or ten minutes to do that. If you just want to sort of gather around in a group of three or four, wherever you are, just take a few minutes to pray for each other. I'll close this in prayer after a few minutes.